you know, I only had three people test this product out before I started selling it. And it worked great for those three people, but they also followed the directions. This is Three Marketers Walk Into a Podcast, episode 58. You're listening to Three Marketers Walk Into a Podcast, brought to you by the fine folks at Response Suite. There's this weird thing happening all over Facebook right now where I'm seeing loads of my friends and colleagues who are marketers and business owners having their PayPal account closed down, like just switched off, sometimes with money still in it. Oh my goodness, it's terrifying. Mm. Hello, this is Rob and Kennedy. Hello. From Response Suite, back once again. With the Renegade Master. I've been... Ah, every, every every week I'm gagging to say that. I think I said it back in episode two or something. You're bringing it back. I'm bringing it back. I like going retro on all of our listeners. You're bringing it back into... Well, into fashion. In fact, it, I'm bringing it into fashion exactly. in the first place. Really Turns looking forward out. to this uh, this episode. We're going to be talking to who exactly, Robert? Laura Castleman. The and C- who the heck she? The CEO of JVZoo, an online what? affiliate platform, product market, digital product marketplace. She's just lush, isn't she? Really, really nice. And an interesting story, an overlap with our story, actually, mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, we used to be a very attractive blonde lady. <laughs> no, uh, because uh, she actually has a background in entertainment. We have a background in entertainment. Yes, she was like a rocket or something. Radio City Radio Rocket. City? Yes, I've been past Radio City Music. Me too. Hall, isn't there like yet. a massive, isn't there a huge... Christmas tree outside of there, near there. Somehow. That's the fr- Rockefeller. That's the Rockefeller Center. Yeah, totally different place. The Rockefeller it? Rocket. The Rocket. <laughs> Why aren't there Rockefeller Rockets? I, I, I reckon, I mean, I'm going to be on a holiday in New York in a few months' time, and I reckon I could be... I could Pop be, your little red frock on. I'd be cracking, wouldn't I? It's really interesting, actually. Yeah, chatting to Laura. Again, she has that transition from being in entertainment and moving across and into the business world. And, and she's now, like, managing... You know, she's the she, chief exec? CEO, yeah. CEO of like one of the biggest affiliate platforms on the planet. And they're doing some amazing stuff. Amazing. Stuff that, you know, we, you know, we didn't get to talk about in the episode, but just amazing pioneering stuff to move, their, move that whole world forward. And we're going to be chatting today about a really important thing in that whole bit, which is how do you remain legal, compliant? Dude, and, that sounds so boring. What, I mean, what, what, why should we listen to this? Because this is important to every business on earth. If and you're, tr- if you're I mean, terrified, I being facetious there. I mean, yes, it is very important. But the thing is, it's really about how do you still do marketing without all the hyperbole around, it's the fastest, freest, automaticest <laughs> thing that's going to... Ninja gonna, 2.0. Ninja, yeah. How do you do it without... Because one... That stuff people can smell the BS a mile off. Yeah. Two, the legals in every country in the world are all over it. PayPal are all over it. The banks are all over it. Shutting people down left, right, and center. And the good news is Laura's here to tell us how to do it properly without getting shut down in a way that actually cuts through all the crap that's out there, right? Yeah, and, and makes it dead simple as well. Talking of all the crap that's out there, let's go to Rob's all-important quote of the week. Yes, because as they say, your vision is the solitude from platitudes to yourself. That's a little bit, isn't it? That is, that just, that just sits just That'll nicely. Set, set you up for the day there. I just, I feel really, whew, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, man. So obviously one of the things we are talking about in this episode is how to penetrate people's minds, how to get them excited, how to get them engaged. And one of the primary ways that we do that is using email marketing. And we want to do that when we communicate with people in a way that's not full of hyperbole, that's exciting, and that still commands people and still still compels people. Hmm. But how do you do it in a way that actually stands out, but also doesn't break all the laws? Yeah, so we're running uh, this special free training. That's right. It's completely free. You can go along and register and attend for free. It's called How to Double Your Sales Automatically Ninja (laughs) 2.0. Guarantee it's not really. No, it's It's called (laughs) this one campaign that we put together and it literally doubled our sales. Now, it might not double your sales, disclaimer, disclaimer, but if you follow the the guidelines, you'll definitely make... Good results. Yeah. <laughs> You'll definitely have a nice time. <laughs> You'll have a lovely time. And it, it, it's a case study. It really is a case study of the three phases we went through to get better results from our emails by cutting through and doing something really, really unusual. Yeah. Right? So you can register for the training completely for free. Just head over to responsesweek.com forward slash webinar and we'll see you on it. We will see you on it. Now, let's get into today's episode and welcome our pal and now yours, Laura Castleman. <laughs> Laura Castleman, welcome to Three Marketers Walk Into a Podcast. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's so good to hang out. Very, very excited to have you here. Now, let's chat about people who are running their businesses. They're maybe in the earliest stages of their business. They're doing well. They've got some great results. What is the kind of the most dangerous thing, the most difficult thing 
but that is kind of down the road for those businesses. I think a lot of times when you start a business, you're, you're running a business, you're just doing absolutely what's necessary to get things going, but you're not thinking about what's down the line as far as legalities and what you are absolutely responsible for, for compliance and policy with your third party vendors. So I think that that's a huge thing. You've just used the C word very, very early on in this podcast, uh, that you'll compliance. And obviously that sends a lot of shivers down a lot of people's spines. But the thing is, for most of us, we got into business because we're what Michael Gerber would call the technician. We're the person who's passionate about the thing we do or the thing we make. What are we responsible for? Well, absolutely. Everything in your business you are responsible for, which is overwhelming at times, but it depends on the industry that you're in and what format you're operating in. So if you're selling a product, then you have a different set of responsibilities from if you're just promoting a product, those types of things. Um, If you're marketing the product as a seller or an affiliate or any other um, level, like um, if you're doing multi-level marketing, you are also responsible for what you put out to your potential consumers as well. So it is really a big important thing for people to know what are your responsibilities in the avenue that you do business in. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people start an online business and then don't really think of it as a company. They don't think of it as a business. Maybe they think, oh, it's just me. I'm just selling me thing. I'm, yeah, I'm just putting stuff on the internet and people are buying it and I'm delivering it to them. So of course, nobody is like a legal expert. Nobody is, we're not lawyers, well, mostly. Uh, so I, I guess what's the first steps for somebody who's currently thinking, well, do you know, what? I've got my product. It's currently selling. I think I'm doing okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm certainly not intentionally scamming anyone. I'm not making false claims by my own standards. So like what, what's the first steps I suppose to working out the different areas of compliance or the different areas of legality they need to consider? Sure. So I think the first step anyone can do that's completely affordable is basic research. Now, when I say basic research and we all are, you know, have access to the internet, I don't mean just Google it and read, you know, Jane down the road's blog. That is not suffice, but I do think that you can go to particular websites and learn about what your responsibilities are. One of those is the FTC. Another thing you're going to want to do is know anyone that you do business with. So your payment processors, PayPal, your auto responders, if you use AWeber, GetResponse, MailChimp, whomever, you have to know what their policies are and what their um, acceptable use standards are. If you do not and you violate them, you are simply responsible. There's no getting around it. There's no playing ignorance. You are responsible if you're doing business. It's really easy for us all to sort of look online and go, well, John, he's selling loads of things and none of the things he says is true. So it must be be true because he's like got a magic pill that's going to make you lose 20 pounds in a half an hour. It's easy to look around and go, well, it must be okay. Like everybody else wouldn't be doing it. Obviously, it's not. We're all sensible grown-ups here. It's not okay. So when you're looking at those, those guidelines, what are you looking for? Like which areas of, areas of your business? So looking internally, looking at we all have websites, we've got tech stuff, we've got financial stuff. Which areas of our business should we be looking at the, the legislation and that around? So I think really important is the FTC. The FTC in particular is cracking down on marketing left and right. Now you referenced weight loss, which is kind of where most of it started, right? People saying, hey, take this diet pill or do this workout and you're going to lose this amount of weight and showing a before and after. And then what they didn't originally show, and now they're showing in the very fine print at the bottom of the TV screen or, you know, your computer screen is that this is not typical results. And this person actually didn't do it for the 21 days. This person did it, you know, six rounds of 21 days while also um, following a separate diet plan and adding exercise in. You're seeing those things now, but it's all about transparency and being clear in your marketing, which is great because you can have a good product that actually does work if people do what you tell them to, but they can't just buy the product and suddenly they've made money or lost weight. Um, And so it's just about truth in marketing and transparency. But the FTC has a lot of guidelines on it that are public. And when you get to the point where you don't understand, it's never a bad idea to call an attorney that actually specializes in FTC and and schedule a one-hour meeting. 
And how far is the reach of the FTC? Because we're a British company, for example, obviously many of our listeners are all over the world. A lot of people in the US, do we even need to really care about the FTC? Absolutely. And the, I think the thing is, it look, you need to look at where you are doing business. Where are your consumers located? So if you personally have consumers located in the United States, then you need to be concerned. And another thing people need to be aware of is what countries are friendly with each other. For example, the United States and the UK. When GDPR rolled out, there were all these people posting online about, you know, the US, we're a sovereign state, you know, we don't have to adhere to what the UK tells us. But at the same point in time, our governments support each other. They work together. So it's not really likely that the United States government's going to say, oh, ha, 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 we're not going to adhere to that, but we're going to push our laws on your people selling to our citizens. That's not the way it's going to work, which is why we saw day one, May 25th, 2018, Google and Facebook get slapped with major lawsuits. Yeah, major. And I mean, it's really easy to think that, oh, here comes Laura. She's lovely. She's what, you know, she's had a lovely career and she's coming along to take all the fun out of my business. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How, do you, how can we still, I mean, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because you go, right, I'm having a lovely time. I've got this website. I've got some testimonials up. I've got a picture of John's before and after. How, like, how do we still? How do we still do effective marketing by getting people excited? Because one of the jobs of, ex- of of marketing is to get people excited, get people emotionally engaged. But we've got to tread that line, haven't we? Absolutely. And you know, so when I'll address the first point about Laura came to steal your fun, because when I first became CEO, and the first things I did at JV Zoo were I took away lifetime, not because the FTC bans the word lifetime but because there's so many stipulations around the word lifetime with the FTC, and it's confusing. Is it for your lifetime? Is it my lifetime? Is it the lifetime of the product? What is the expected life um, of the product? You know, all these things. And I said, let's just make it less confusing. Then I implemented compliance checks and I asked our, my competitors, hey, let's do this and clean up the industry together. Well, what we saw is that my competitors did not do that until January of this year. So that's about three years after I implemented compliance. And people were complaining, who is JV Zoo to review my product? Who is JV Zoo to tell me how to run my business? Mm-hmm. But then what you saw was it flip on a dime in January. And why wasn't FT, why wasn't, I mean, JV Zoo with stronger compliance? Why didn't they tell me I was going to be violating my payment processors acceptable use policy that changed? Why weren't they psychic? Why didn't they know? (laughs) Um, So you saw all those things happen. But as far as marketing, I think the best way any of us can market is to market with the benefits. What are the actual benefits? You can get people excited over what your product actually does. There are plenty of marketing buzzwords, keywords, but you can do it truthfully. And you can do it by saying, hey, you know, I only had three people test this product out before I started selling it. And it worked great for those three people, but they also followed the directions, you know, they put the work in kind of thing, disclaiming your earnings. Um, you know, you the people that are giving you testimonials for earnings, disclaiming those things and also doing real testimonials. Don't go to Fiverr and buy six testimonials or just write them yourself and give people, you know, we, we have actually seen at JV Zoo reviewing products our own employees' names and photographs for fake testimonials. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we've talked about a bunch of things here. We've talked about testimonials. We've talked about, um, you know, claiming things that your product can't do, all that stuff. And the, the big bottom line here is have a product that's actually good enough to stand the test of time with, with no sales pitch at all, mm-hmm. and then give it an honest and good sales pitch. So that's great. What would you say are the top three or four things that you see as a uh, you know, running JV Zoo and looking at products that maybe aren't on JV Zoo as well, where you think, oh God, just stop doing that one thing because the, the, the marketer might not just not know that they're currently not compliant. So there's some obvious things like fake testimonials and stuff. What would you say are some of the more subtle things that you maybe see and the market doesn't particularly know they're doing anything wrong? Well, I wouldn't think this is subtle and that people wouldn't see it, but I have learned over the last 60 days that it is people don't understand it. So right now, what we are seeing in mass is the payment processors cracking down on what they consider get rich quick or make money fast. So those two things across the board, every payment processor because of their underwriters are cracking down on those two things. 
So I'm having people apply for new processors and then they're angry because they're denied. And I look at the sales page of the product that they submitted to be reviewed and it's make $500 every night while you sleep on autopilot. And I'm like, okay, so guys, it's a, it's a get rich quick. Well, that's not get rich quick. It's $500 a night, Laura. Okay. So now we're looking at what do you consider rich and what do other people consider rich, but it's the whole make money overnight autopilot. Autopilot is a red flag word, by the way, for the FTC, as well as payment processors. Um, and it depends on how you're using it, but anything with money and autopilot and an amount um, of money being said or guaranteed or promised, um, those things are absolute red flags. And for some people, actually in the masses um, of JVZoo users, we're seeing it not compute to them that any financial claim and it happening in a short amount of time or overnight or automated in any way, shape or form that they're not understanding that is perceived as a make money fast or a get rich quick. That's really, really interesting. I want to get back to this, but before, I've got so many more questions to dig into because obviously you've become pretty obsessed with this thing, as you should do uh, in, your, in your position. So I want to d- dive into more of that in a moment. But before that, we, we come up with a very customized, totally personal game for every single guest. And what we've done with you is because you're called Laura Castleman and because you're in JV Zoo, we've got a list. It's, it's I ten, can't it's, wait it's, for how tenuous it's this tenuous. is. It's tenuous. This is a tenuous I one. left Kennedy with the rule of coming up with the game for this episode. That was a bad mistake. I was in the office this morning and I, came home to, and I came home to this. Okay, <laughs> so this is it. We've got JV Zoo and Laura Castleman. I'm going to say that, right? Here we Which go. It's spelt differently to the word castle, but okay. Okay, right. So I'm going, to, I'm going to read out a list of 10 different words. Your job, Laura Castleman from JV Zoo is to tell us, is that the name of an animal from a zoo or is it the name of a castle somewhere in the world? So it's castle or zoo animal. Okay. All right, we're going to go with number one. Number one is bongo. Is that a castle or an animal? Oh my gosh. I am um, going to go with a castle. It's not. It's a kind of antelope, I'm afraid. So you can't go into... That'd be quite awkward. Uh, the next one is uh, honey eater. <laughs> A uh, honey eater. See, I want to say that's an animal. It is. It's a bird. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next one is Howard. And that's not the name of a thing, by the way. <laughs> Howard. I'm going to say Howard is a castle. It is Castle Howard. So that's two for you. Bell ringer. Bell ringer castle. It's a turtle, I'm afraid. Oh my gosh. The next one is Blarney. Blarney castle. Yes. Oh, it's a go. famous one. We had to throw that one in. <laughs> Thank Trims. you. Thanks for that one. You're welcome. Trim. Trim? Mm, could be a fish. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. Castle. It is a castle. Good guess. It was nearly a fish, wasn't it? Yeah. No, it's definitely <laughs> a castle. Trim castle. The next one, pink fairy. Pink fairy is a castle. It's an armadillo. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also hard on the outside, so that's pretty good. Uh, go away. That's not an instruction, that's a question. <laughs> go away is mm. a castle. It's not. It's actually a bird. The full name of it is the white-bellied go-away bird. Well, who names these I things? I don't know. Crazy people. <laughs> Next one. Is that Tint Angel? Tint, 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 tint Angel? Tint Tangle? <laughs> <laughs> okay, a castle. It is a castle. It's near Cornwall. And the final one, my favorite, Dick Dick. <laughs> Dick Dick. I'm going to go with it's an animal. It is. It's a kind of antelope. Oh, what a lucky antelope. That's six out of ten. That's six out of ten. Laura right. Castle yeah. Castleman from JV Zoo. That's amazing. Six out of ten. Yeah, can we ten. just, can we just clip that? the lowest test score I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> can we just clip that bit of audio where Kennedy said, Dick Dick's my favorite, and then just loop it all <laughs> yes. Can we just put it on loop at all times, like a little <laughs> gif of me going, eh, 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 all the time. Oh, oh, let's drag this second and screaming back to why Laura's here. All right, yeah, yeah, why Laura's still here. Oh, yeah, Laura's here. Great, hello. Uh, we're back. So... There's, we were talking about making claims on websites. Obviously, we can't be doing that. But what's all this chat about implicit claims, all these implied claims saying how I made $100 bajillion on autopilot in 24 hours? 
is that okay? Or is that, because I've heard different stories. Some people are like, well, that's totally cool. Others are like, well, no, it's not cool because you're implying they can do it too. Where do you sit on that? So the law is unclear on it. And what we've seen is that the FTC has certain things that are considered aggravations. So they're not actually violating the law, but if they find out something else that you're doing that is violating the law, say you have three fake testimonials on your page, and that's in direct violation of FTC regulation. But then you have this, how I made this amount of money on autopilot. And it's this implied thing that you can do, or the consumer can do it as well. That will be an aggravation and an additional fine. Right. So it's like, it's, it's a, it's a naughty ticket. It's a tick in the naughty box, which is going to just pee them off. And if you do that too much, then they're going to, you're going to, they're going to add to it. It's going to be cumulative. That's interesting. But one of the things that really strikes me is some people might see this as like the doom and gloom. Here come the three of us where the grim reapers of marketing saying, sorry, turn it all off lads and lasses. But really what this could be is an opportunity to stand out from all the scammy crap that's out there and actually sell through hark, honesty, right? That's a massive opportunity, isn't it? What a concept, right? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine going, these results are absolutely not typical. I want to tell you about what one guy did, and I'm absolutely not saying you could do it, but this guy did because he's mad. And you tell the story, and you're being absolutely, totally honest about what happened, as long as you are being honest, or saying, look, I can't guarantee any result. This is what it does. Are you going to use it? Are you effective? Go do it. Absolutely. And I think the biggest thing is not promising people that they will do it and not selling it like it's a promise, but saying, hey, this method has worked before and it may work for you if you put the work in, but it's work. No one is, you know, okay, you can buy a lottery ticket and you can possibly become a multimillionaire overnight, but the chances of that are very low, right? We all know that. So as long as you're aware of what you're getting into as a consumer, then I think we're doing the right things. I think so. I think one of the things we can do though, psychologically speaking, is we can tap into people's want to be seen as successful and the person who works hard and does the right thing. So we don't have to say now you can buy this thing, but you're going to have to work really, really hard. All you need to do is look at some much more persuasive language, which actually appeals to ego. So use the same marketing skills you're already using in one way and apply them to the person saying, hey, if you want to be successful, one of the skills you're going to have to master is being an action taker, a person who does all of these things. And if you do all those things, this is, this is what our solution does. So you're just using those skills in a different way. Does that even make sense? It does, yeah. I think... Yeah. I think going back to Kennedy's question from earlier about, you know, do we need to care about the FTC if we're not in the States and stuff? Obviously, one of the, one of the knock-on effects of the FTC is that if your web host is in the US or your autoresponder is in the US, presumably they have some uh, ability to close you down, you know, just in those from behind the scenes, just by saying, well, we'll take down your web hosting and we'll take down that. Is that true or is that just a room? Um, from what I understand, it is true. You know, the, those things are not my forte. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because everything that I use is based in the U S the difference for me is as JV zoo, we have consumers all over the world as well as users all over the world. So we don't get to opt out of, do we adhere to, you know, the new laws in the United kingdom or do we adhere to the can spam or not can spam, but the email laws that are now opt in only in Australia and Canada. Mm -hmm. Those are, you know, we have to do all of those things. And I think it's only smart business if your consumers are in a country um, or your user base, depending, then you need to um, respect that country's laws. Yeah. And let's just take a look at like how, like, like, what does that look like as a perception of your brand? If you're proactively protecting your customers from all of that shady business and being proactive around the idea of compliance and, and being very current, very present, rather than go, ah, but we've done it like this for years. Then if you're seeing as the people who are cutting edge, who are being proactive in all of this, then you're seeing your reputation and the brand association with that can only be good. Absolutely. What would you say? There's a lot of people, you know, JVZoo sprung up uh, at the perfect time where one of your sort of major competitors, I guess, was starting to make it more difficult to get products approved. And, and, and I think vendors were getting annoyed with the fact that they had to work really, really hard. And then JVZoo came up the perfect time and it had loads of great benefits. Like you could instantly, you can now use PayPal and have instant payouts to affiliates and all that amazing stuff that people love to use now. 
And obviously what started to happen recently is that PayPal have started to get a bit crotchety with some of the, some of the vendors and they've started crotchety. to shut people down. It's a good word, isn't it? Mm-hmm. They've started to shut people down. And what's happened is a bunch of people have gone, well, that's it then. Uh, we can't use PayPal anymore because PayPal doesn't let you sell things on the internet. Like that's how blanket they've taken mm-hmm. it. Oh, no, mm-hmm. PayPal, they don't let you sell anything on the internet anymore. So in other words, they're now looking for some of the new alternative. And it's sort of like they're constantly jumping out of some lion's cage and finding that somewhere that's a bit safer to be. How, like, what can we do? Reassure the listeners and us, I guess, that what actually the, the simple thing to do is to look at the process and say, okay, great. Rather than just running away from stuff all the time, how do we build something that is actually compliant for pay from a, not just a legal standpoint, but now from a payment processor standpoint as well? Because obviously this is something you spent a lot of time looking at recently. Absolutely. So the first piece of business advice that I would give anyone, no matter what industry you're in, is that you need to diversify. You have to diversify. You put all your eggs in one basket. If something goes wrong, then that's your business. That's everything you've worked for. Mm -hmm. So I have recently seen posts online that, oh, JB Zoo, you would have thought they would have learned. They put all their eggs in the basket of PayPal and then PayPal's been gone. Well, that's actually untrue. JB Zoo has had Um, since 2013, Stripe merchant accounts. Then we added in multiple other processors and we've added even more recently for our users. But JVZoo didn't put our eggs in that basket. Each individual seller put their eggs in that basket, um, if that makes sense. But as a business, we were already diversified. We already had people using Stripe merchant accounts. um, And then we had released Zift, so we've got people there. But diversification is huge. When it comes to using a platform like a JVZoo or one of our competitors, I will say this. If you do not know that platform is adhering to all required legalities, because the platform is always going to be bigger than your individual business, Mm -hmm. then you shouldn't be doing business there. I am currently watching things and I I am limited to what I can say about other platforms, but I am seeing massive laws being broken. And they're supposedly leaders in our industry. And they are. They're leading people to slaughter right now. It is just driving cattle right to slaughter. And and people are eating it up. And so be it. Because, you know, I've got a business to run here. I have, since I've been in place, been, you know, the laws and compliance matter. And that's what JVZoo will continue to do. Um, But I think you need to diversify. You need to look at your third parties. Because JVZoo is a third party to all of you. So you need to look at what our um, policies are. You need to know what your payment processor policies are, your autoresponders. If you're integrating with, um, for physical products, a shipping facility, you need to know what their policies are. And it is your responsibility. And then unfortunately, you will always have very large companies. I'm talking about, you know, PayPal large that can wipe out hundreds of millions off their bottom line in a month or two months and it not affect them because they're that big. And that's what they've done. They changed the policy. They did not make it public. And no, I wasn't psychic. I did see things happening and they didn't actually start on JVZoo's platform. I saw them happening on another platform. And that's why I personally posted about it and flew out to San Jose in August to start addressing some of these things I was seeing with PayPal. But I don't work for PayPal and they don't report to me. And they didn't share much more information with me than they shared with anyone else. So... That, you know, when you have a corporation that big, then we are all a little bit at their mercy, which is why diversification is huge. You need to have another place you're processing money through in case your primary shuts down. It's really interesting to think about that. When people say, well, hearing it, we're happy with the high street banks as well, where people are having issues with that. Here in the UK, a whole bunch of people have been having problems with particular, two particular banks just going, yeah, yeah, that's enough of that. Thank you very much. You can't run your business with us because you didn't, didn't fill in a single form, like one mm-hmm. single piece of paper. And it's all happening. And most, most larger businesses, as they're growing, you need to be making sure that you've got cash in different bank accounts. And you're, like you said, you're diversifying across and, and moving that, that um, what's the word? That, that, uh, that, that risk, I suppose, is the word I'm looking for. Mm. Now, we're going to... Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, with you saying you're seeing it in banks there, it is a worldwide thing we're seeing with underwriters. So it's the underwriters who are changing their policies. So Visa, MasterCard, Amex, everyone, PayPal, they're all having to answer to the underwriters right now who are changing policy worldwide. 
Wow. It's, it's, so it's, it's like the, um, it's almost like this, the secret, the secret thing underneath the layer, isn't it? It's not just looking at PayPal and Visa and MasterCard and Amex and everybody else, but actually looking at like who's running the show behind the scenes. Yeah. The well. invisible, the invisible people, the Illuminati. Well, so, the people fronting the money. And so what they're considering high risk, they're mitigating because they're the ones fronting the money. Makes of course, sense. Of course. <laughs> Now, Laura, we're going to interrupt proceedings one more time for our second and favorite game of the episode. Here's how it works. My colleague Kennedy here. Hello. That's him. He's going to Hello. sing a song for you now, Laura. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, and he's going to sing a song, but in the style of a traditional British club singer. That means that some of the words will be confused, disguised, indistinguishable. And you, Laura, have to try and guess. God help you. What song? <laughs> Kennedy is singing. Take It'll away. be easier to understand PayPal's terms and conditions than to figure this out. All right. It's a spitty dippy. It is a bitch in the pitchy bay. It is a bit to death in bed in bay. It is a bit to death in bed in bay. It is a bit to death in bed in bay. It is a bit to death in bed in bay. Was that a verse or a chorus? That was a verse and a chorus. Just to let you know, I picked this song literally about 30 seconds ago and he just had to just go with it. So, Laura, any idea what that was? It sounded like a drunken person in a bar going crazy. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it was a classic. Rick Astley, I, never going to give you up. Oh my gosh, I would have never have guessed that. What? <laughs> I know you're smart, but come on. <laughs> well, so let's, as we approach the end of this episode, let's kind of start to wrap things up. I guess with what's your kind of final advice, your final um, parting words here to give to listeners and to us who are thinking, oh, no, this sounds like a minefield. I just want to sell me thing. How, what's the final advice to take those people and sort of send them off on a, on a positive path to know, actually, this is going to work for me. This isn't going to stop me. I think the biggest thing is knowing your consumers. And we're all very good at that in this industry. Anyone who's seen any success, it's because we actually do know who we're selling to. So remove the stress of, oh my gosh, now how do I need to form my sales letter? And answer the questions or solve the problems that your end consumer has. When you do that, you're still going to sell your product. It's what you're already good at doing. So just don't worry about what you did last year or two years ago or how you sold and think about how, how you can answer those questions for your consumer now, how you can solve those problems and just give them the answer in a very honest format. Precisely said. I think lots to think about in this episode. Before we let you go, we're going to head into what we affectionately call the quick fire round. Hey, hey, you don't want to miss out on more of these fabulous nuggets, do you? Make sure you subscribe to the Three Marketers Podcast now on your podcast player. So question number one, Laura, what would be a book that you recommend? Rise of the JV Zoo Superheroes. Shame. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Unashamed. Unashamed. <laughs> what is your top success habit? Something you do regularly? I think I'm so organized that that's my biggest thing. Even running a tech company, I, I keep pen to paper always. Carry a notebook with me, writing it down, reading it, commits it to memory for me. And then I love, I, I, I have daily, monthly, um, yearly checklist and I make sure that I get everything done. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Can you give us an entrepreneur or a marketer that you really look up to? I love Marie Forleo, mostly because she's funny, she's entertaining, she does great business, and she gives back constantly. Love that. What are some of your favorite apps and things that you actually use yourself to run your life? Slack. I, I, I think I'm married to Slack. Um, <laughs> it's how I run all my teams for every project and business, and it, it doesn't break down or stop working like other um, blue icons with an S. Um, <laughs> so I love Slack. Mm -hmm. Big important question now, Laura. Who do you like more, Redhead Rob or Platinum Head Kennedy? Well, I think the biggest thing for me is I'm not into favorites. I don't have a favorite food or a color or any of those things. And I think you're both great. Some people might call that non-committal. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final question. If people want to find out more about you, where should we head to? Ah, my website, lauracastleman.com or my Instagram, the Laura Castleman. I'm loving it. Thank you so much for all this insight. It's one of those really difficult subjects for a lot of people. Obviously, you've done your research. You're really, you be, you're really in the thick and in the weeds with this. So massive thanks for coming and hanging out and sharing so much. Guys, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Well, she was pretty ninja 2.0. Absolutely. She, that is a lady who absolutely knows what she's doing. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and gets it, like really understands the future of where this is all heading. I mean, she's literally sitting in meetings with the big wigs over at PayPal going, right, how do we make this work? She's not fighting them. She's not like one of those CEOs. That's what I, one of the things I absolutely love about her is she's not like fighting and saying, well, we're going to try and get one over on them and try and circumvent the rules. No, no, no. She's sitting across the table and going, I get it. I understand. I want to make the internet a better place, which is a hell of a mission, by the way, she's got. How do we do that? How do we work together to make it happen? And I think by taking on board a lot of the, lot of the stuff she talked about, not only are we going to stay more compliant, which means we're not going to lose our businesses or our, certainly our ways of taking payment overnight or end up in, in a jail cell at some point for over-promising, under-delivering stuff. But also, we're going to cut through all of that stuff and be better at all of this. And it allows us an opportunity to be more creative, I think. And yes, this mission of hers is going to put some businesses out of business. There's some people that are going to go out of business here because if you are continuing to tread that line or yeah. in some cases, just jump right over it yeah. into the slightly darker side of the web and you are there just making stuff up or lying or using... I mean, I saw a thing the other day with fake Fiverr testimonials on it because I recognized the faces from yeah. other testimonials where they're different people. Yeah, terrible, terrible stuff. Wow, and it's wow, still wow. happening. Luckily, none of our listeners are like that. So that's quite good. No, absolutely. So yeah, you're, you're going to be safe. You're going to be grand if you... Keep your nose clean, folks. Keep that nose clean. Now, if you missed anything from this episode, don't worry, of course, as ever, we've popped all the show notes together for you to make it nice and easy. Just head over to blog.responsesuite.com forward slash 058. And when you're there over at 058 band, do us a favor, leave us a comment on that blog. You know, we never talk about leaving comments on our blog. And I would love to know how you see what we've just talked about in this episode. How are you going to apply to what you're going to do? What have you already done? How are you staying compliant? And I'd personally love to read those stories. So go over to blog.responsesuite.com slash 058 and let us know in the comment section right below there. And we will reply to every single comment, Scouts Honor, I promise you. Now, aside from that, we are, of course, going to be back here, same time, same place next week for the next episode. So we're looking forward to that. In the meantime, again, if you've got any big takeaways, the big aha moments from this episode, you can also get us on all the socials. It's just at Response Suite on Blummin' Everything. Blummin' Everything. Right. Let's get off and run a software company, shall we? Don't miss a thing. thing. Check out the show notes at blog.responsesuite.com.